Hello everybody, welcome to our Cake Foo Master Series. I am Amelia Carbine and I am your host for the day. Uh, I am glad that you guys are all here. We have a really, really special guest today. He is extremely talented with sculpting. He is quite the artist and I'm, I'm really, really excited to, to have Burton Farnsworth with us today. So welcome Burton. Thank you. Yeah. Should I be, I'm sorry, that was a really boring response. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> as, as long as you know you get the information across, we're <laughs> we're good. Okay, so let's start out with a little bit of information about you, Burton, and you know explain to everybody kind of your background and where you came from, how how you discovered cake decorating, and you know why why you stuck with it. <laughs> Okay, I probably would be a little vague about my past because I will likely tell stories on people and uh, I don't want you to necessarily know who those people are. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, did, I graduated from college with a fine art degree and then went to work for an a international consulting firm uh, as a graphic artist and I worked as an illustrator and I worked on projects that were all proprietary so I have this portfolio of stuff I can't show anybody um, but I got involved in uh, what they did a lot of uh, consumer research um, for politics advertising uh, broadcast programming stuff like that and eventually I ended up doing stuff on the research side um, so I was actually for uh, many years involved in audience testing uh, broadcast programming. A lot of it was advertisements or uh, message testing, that kind of thing. Um, so it's very interesting when you're sitting on a set and a 25-year-old production assistant looks at you and says, well, you're a cake decorator. So you really don't understand how this is going to play on television. <laughs> um, but they say it, and you just sort of you nod and go. I'm I'm sure that that uh, that I don't, but I'm also <laughs> absolutely certain that you have no idea how this is. Um, but uh, then uh, I then moved on to visual communications consulting, and uh, eventually ended up freelancing. And it was while I was freelancing that I sort of stumbled across across cake decorating. Uh, because it seemed like a logical extension. Um, I don't really know why. It's just something, uh, I don't know, a couple of people I knew had done some of it and thought maybe I could, and then they made me watch the TV shows, and I started doing some of it, and it seemed like fun at the time. Uh, and, you know, I still tried to keep my foot in the door with the uh, all of the communications-related stuff. Um, and so I've sort of juggled all of that uh, ever since um, for the past 30-some years. Well, the cake decorating thing is much more recent. Um, and uh, I'm just reading off the slide now. I, I tell people never just to read off their own <laughs> slides, and I'm now reading bullet points. Um, but uh, so in my relatively short uh, K career, I have had the opportunity to lose on both Food Network Challenge and the new Food Network Sugar Dome. Uh, so, you know, nothing like total public humiliation to uh, to beef up that uh, that resume. <laughs> well, you um, know, I I really did enjoy your uh, Food Network Challenge. It it was sad that you had the. <laughs> do you, Do you want to tell everybody about that? That, uh... um, a little. I will get into some of that a little bit later because it is relevant. Oh, that's right. Though, we do have some pictures of that, don't we? I I did enjoy uh, being on challenge very much. Um, it was you know it was exhausting and stuff, but I pretty much enjoyed the whole thing. There was that one point, but otherwise I quite enjoyed it. Um, uh, I'll move well, on. From we can we can get to that later. <laughs> that's but, that's uh, right. And you and, you, know, you pride oh, yourself in you know. The fact that you have never walked away from a competition empty-handed, I think you know that's that's a good thing. It's it's a sign that you understand what people are looking for. Well, except on television, but otherwise, <laughs> um, where I can say on television, I've never walked away clean-handed. But 
but yes, in uh, in cake shows, it's true. That I've I've never actually left a cake show without some kind of award, um, and that sounds really arrogant, but uh, that's that's to the point. I wouldn't just bring that up just out of the blue. It's it's relevant to what I want to talk about. Um, which is me. Uh, I love to talk about me. I'm fascinating, and it is time well spent. Um, no. <laughs> it, uh, well, we can all learn something from you. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, well, let's hope we can. Um, if we can move on to the, yes, uh, the first slide, um, because what uh, my first, the first cake show I ever participated in, I didn't. Uh, we've gone ahead. We're uh, we're ahead one. Oh, At least what I'm seeing on my screen is uh, is ahead of what I was expecting. Is it that one? No, it's not that one. It should be a Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Hopefully okay. I sent that slide to you. That would be a problem. Anyway, um, I'll let, let you fumble around and, uh, and hope that we come up with the right slide. But my first cake show was uh, I had only been doing cakes for a few months and didn't really know what cake shows were about. But I was encouraged to enter and thought, you know, what the heck, I might as well figure out if I'm any good at this. Um, and so I went and entered. And I might have gone in a little cocky uh, until I actually got there and walked into the room where all the cakes were, in which point I realized that I was way in over my head and had no idea what I was supposed to be expecting. Uh, and the the entry was, it was, uh, we don't have a picture of it, but it um, was yeah, um, I'm looking for it right now. a three-tiered wedding cake, well, from one angle. It was a Bride of Frankenstein cake, and because uh, uh, I was shooting the breeze with some people, and somebody said, you know, it'd be funny to have the Bride of Frankenstein as the, the cake topper on a cake. That would be funny, and I thought that would be funny, and I started playing around with it and initially the thought was kind of you know people were coming up with basically Halloween ideas um, and I'll make it a sort of a, a Halloween-ish looking a scary looking cake with you know, a lot of Frankenstein-ish decorations on it but it didn't seem right to me because the point of Frankenstein I'm a big fan of, of Mary Shelley's uh, uh, gothic novel is that Victor Frankenstein was trying to build something better he was trying to build a perfect man. It just went horribly wrong. And so to me, the, the right way to approach the cake was to take, have the cake be part wedding cake, part of another cake. Cakes that people enjoy all stuck together and stitched back together in the attempt to make the perfect cake. But of course, it goes horribly wrong, so it looks funny. Um, <laughs> and if I had, had done it, you know, had more time and more skill, I would have had some of the, the tiers be different heights where the different cakes matched up, but that was a little bit beyond my skill level at that point. But I, you know, had the stitching, and uh, hey, Hang I can on. see you. I think, I've, I think I've found it. Hang on just okay. a second. Um, should we talk about you since you're on screen? Oh, or should of we course. just keep going? <laughs> oh, there it is. So there, so there is my, uh, my Bride of Frankenstein cake. Um, my first entry ever in a, at a cake show. Um, obviously, I had no idea about uh, cake board proportion, but I you know, came up with this idea of stitching various cakes together and putting the figures on top. And it was at that show when I was first introduced to the idea of discretionary points on the part of the judges. Because uh, I did well. I placed. And being curious, I peeked at the score sheet of the cake next to mine, which I thought was very good. And uh, and their scores were better, except for these discretionary points, which pushed me ahead. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what discretionary points were, so I went and approached the judges, which was a bad idea, as I realized <laughs> later. I mean, they explained it to me, and it was very helpful. And I said, you know, and I think uh, not all shows do this, and I think they probably should. It's gives the judges a chance to go through and uh, try as, ob as objectively as they can score the various aspects of your cake, use of color, originality, things like that. 
but also because sometimes a judge just looks at a cake and says, I like this better than that one, even though I know that this person, you know, technically did a better job, it leaves me just a little cold. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my experience, my professional experience before that in, uh, in marketing and communication and stuff like that, I knew that decisions, all of our important decisions are emotional. We talk about being rational beings, but we make decisions on emotional criteria, and Absolutely. then we justify them with you know, rational arguments. And if we can come up with enough rational arguments, we can do what we want. <laughs> like, you know, I want to buy that car, but if I buy that car, then my children will have to go hungry a lot because I don't have enough money to buy the car and feed my kids. And so every time we're sitting at the dinner table with my kids starving, I'm going to feel bad. So maybe I really don't want that car. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way the process goes. So this discretionary points thing was great because it let judges just say, you know, I just, this one grabbed my attention just a little bit more. You know, I, I can objectively score it and then just give this one a few more points. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that I could manipulate the judges. Not only could I manipulate them, but they wanted to be manipulated. They want to walk up to a cake show entry and have it diddle with their emotions. They want to be moved. They want to be excited. They want, you know, it's just like when we go to the movies or listen to music, we go to have our emotions manipulated, even though we have kind of negative connotations for that word. And <laughs> well, that's so very true, though. I set out to continue manipulating cake show judges. And the only way that I knew how to do it was with this idea of telling a story, because it had worked for me once. This, you know, I tried to interpret the real story of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as opposed to the Boris Karloff film uh, by rather than getting all scary I wanted to try and show somebody attempting to build the perfect cake and having it work out less than was desirable. Uh, we can go on to the next slide I think. Okay. I have to find it again. I, um, I, missed, I missed that apparently. So we're, we're back though. Okay. Um, so the next slide, there we go. Um, so now we're jumping ahead seven months. Um, the first one I did get to compete in the beginners category. That was that was nice. Um, seven seven months later, uh, I went to Oklahoma. And now I had since made the mistake of uh, of just asking show organizers. I'd been to a couple in between, but I'd made the mistake of asking show organizers where they thought I should classify my piece. So uh, here I am less, well, about a year into cake decorating and I was competing in the semi-professional division because I sent an email saying, here's an example of my work. What category should I be in? I was freaked out a little bit when I get an email from Carrie Vincent mm -hmm. saying, this is the division I think you should be in. And I was not in any position I felt to argue with Carrie Vincent. Uh, <laughs> so but it was a little intimidating and so but you know I was gonna rely on this idea of telling a story and hopefully this is where I'm getting into what's actually helpful to people listening in uh, all I knew to do was try and tell a good story and you know suck the judges in now I had uh, an instructor uh, a man he's a he's a internationally famous fantasy illustrator his name's James Christensen, and I did have an opportunity to study under him at one point. But you know, I, the temptation is always to imitate your instructors, the ones that you like. And so I was trying desperately not to ever imitate him in my two-dimensional art. But I figured, well, now I'm switching to three dimensions. So it's the perfect time to just totally rip the guy off. <laughs> but I didn't want to totally rip him off. I just wanted to imitate his style and some of the kinds of themes that he used because I really loved the imagery he created. So I did take one of his themes, this idea of uh, the pear balancer, which he did a painting. And my cake looks nothing like that painting. But he later did kind of a series on the same idea of very elaborately produced entertainment, guys on stage with a lot of costuming. But really, the talent that they're displaying is pretty mediocre. And the hope is that you know, if you just put enough flash and flair into it that you can confuse the audience into thinking they've seen something good, even though what you've got to offer is 
pretty poor. Um, and so this idea of this guy who's a pair balancer, he's up there balancing a pair on his finger, not that great. And if you can see the detail, he's got a bucket of pears next to him. And then off stage, down on the ground, is a bag of pears that he's dropped and bruised and wrecked. <laughs> and there's more pears in that bag than he's got in the bucket. So obviously, he's really not even good at balancing a pear on his finger. As poor as that is for entertainment, he's not even good at it. And the point of the whole thing, besides just coming up with this elaborate costuming and playing around with some of this imagery, was here I was competing as a uh, in this semi-professional division, I was still trying to master fondant and modeling chocolate, and I felt like I was kind of that person. I'm just trying to put enough excitement into it that they don't realize that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and so it was a very personal story for me, and, and that helped, me, helped guide me with the details that I wanted to add, the things that made the story both the overt story and my little secret story um, work better in my mind. And so I knew which details to work in, which ones didn't really contribute to the story. And it helped me, you know, my work was better as I followed the storyline. I didn't put in stuff that was, that was pointless. And it wasn't just a collection of things that surrounded this kind of person. Everything in there was part of the telling of the story. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the judges did get drawn into the story. And I know this because nobody knew who I was. And so I could follow the judges around and listen to them talk about my piece. Because the assumption was that I was the bored husband of some cake decorator who's just got dragged to this show and is wandering around <laughs> until he can go get a hot dog. Um, that's why I say it's a mistake to go and approach the judges afterwards because then they know who you are. Yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. if you approach enough of them, you're bound to run into them again. And I did that again at this show where I approached the judges and asked them you know, what they liked and especially what they didn't like about my piece because there's nothing better than having somebody that knows what they're doing rip you apart <laughs> because then you know what you did wrong. And uh, But it was... But it was better because they weren't sugar coating, sugar, bleh, sugar coating, it, when they're just talking amongst themselves, and I'm just standing there looking at uh, at another cake. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess they didn't notice that I kept glancing over at them and paying a, a lot of attention to what they were saying. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Okay. At this, about the same time, I had another piece that was that was kind of of a similar theme. Now, most of the broad attention that I had gotten from my work up to that point was on the website Cake Rex. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it was in a in a positive light, uh, but that's you know that was my claim to fame, and I thought I would would honor uh, the gal that that does Cake Rex by taking uh, kind of this symbolic character, their iconographic uh, <laughs> carrot jockey baby, <Yes. laughs> and, uh, and turn it into me. Because here I was, a guy I'd already had you know, a career. I'm starting on kind of a new one. I'm no spring chicken. Don't know what I'm doing. So here I am. This is me as a mohawk aging carrot jockey. Uh, and now the, the bottom tier of this cake, I tried to make it very clean and pristine and nice. And then the pillars that are supporting the top lever are, layer are, or tier, sorry, mm -hmm. are crumbling. One of them's even been replaced with just a wooden post, which is cracking and has a thing <laughs> tied around it to hold it from splitting. Um, and then the top tier has essentially me as, as this carrot jockey on one of those... It's essentially one of those rides like you find outside of Target or Kmart oh, yeah. uh -huh. where you put a your coin, coin in and then it shakes you <laughs> around for a few minutes because that's fun. Um, and then a few other things that were just relevant to me. And I debated some of those because I figured nobody would ever be able to make the connection, but it did tell my internal story. Um, and so I put them in. And, of course, I spied on the judges. Now, on the back of this piece, there's also on the bottom tier, I 
made it look like it was spray painted graffiti and it says fondant is a cruel mistress <laughs> um, and then I tried to get clever and there's kind of a draped sign across the side of that top tier that says in Latin essentially please keep your arms and legs inside the carrot but Latin doesn't have a word for carrot so um, oh. <laughs> So that, that didn't really work out as well as I'd hoped. And it turns out that a lot of cake show judges don't read Latin, at least not any better than I do. But what I notice is they're looking at it, and I had these little things in there that I think of as Easter eggs. If you're familiar with the software idea of Easter eggs or websites, yes. where there's little things that you can find, and they're funny if you see them. And so the detail that I put into the piece were like little Easter eggs. If you know, you'd could find one and they related to the story and hopefully you know it made it fun to stay with the piece a little bit longer and made it worth staying with the piece so that as the judges could look around you know they'd see or even just people at the show could you know keep looking and figure there seems to be something going on here some thread of a story I don't know what it is but there's these little things and hopefully they were worth finding and as I you know spy on people as they'd walk past I found that yes, some people were enjoying them and you know telling their friends, and even the judges were doing it mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know this is great, this is cool, and then you know I noticed them moving on to another piece that was nearby now, this other piece that was very close to mine was a beautiful I mean, it was a flawless execution of a fairly common cake show theme. Uh, I won't go into what it was. I mean, it was it was gorgeous. I could not find a single thing wrong with it. No cracks in the fondant or gum paste. I mean, it was exquisite in its execution. But it was a theme that is not uncommon at by with cake decorators and mm -hmm. you know, subsequently at cake shows. And they looked at it and they commented on how well done it was. And, you know, it was cute, and they, they talked about it a little, but they didn't spend as much time with it as they spent with mine. And then after they were done, they went back to mine, talked about it a little bit more, and then moved on. Um, and so, of course, I'm feeling really good because they went back. Well, they first went back to mine. I thought, uh-oh, you know, they're going <laughs> back. But they seemed happy about it again. And, you know, it really brought home to me that, you know, one of the things they pointed out was, you know, this is a very good example of this type of cake decorating, but they'd seen it before. Yeah. And, and because of that, they sort of dismissed it a little bit. It wasn't new. It was gorgeous, but it wasn't something that, you know, they'd seen it, they scored it, they moved on. And so, you know, that's when I really got hooked on this storytelling idea. I needed to tell stories. I needed to suck people in. And the best thing about that was is that my work improved when I had a better story. I think we can move on to the next mm -hmm. slide. Um, Before you start talking about the next one, can you, um, there, there's someone that asked uh, how you placed on the pear cake. How I placed on the pear cake? Yes, they want to know how you placed. Uh, I got Do you remember? <laughs> first place in the category, and I also got first place in the division. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I, sh I just should just say, I kicked butt with the pair piece. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> I, I have never done so well with a piece ever since. No, um, I did take first in its category and, and first. And the other, the, uh, the other one that we just left also took... Uh, first place in its category but it was competing against the other one so it got I beat my own piece oh, I for see. <laughs> uh, that's the interesting thing you get when you approach the judges and nag them and stuff and they tell you these things just so that you'll go away if we, if we give them enough information he'll be satisfied and leave us alone <laughs> um, now sometimes you know one of the things this next piece is one I just did it because I was trying to get more comfortable with modeling chocolate and candy clay and that kind of thing. So it was a single figure. I didn't have much of a story for it. Really, it was just, you know, I came up with an idea and 
uh, I started building it and I struggled and I started making up sort of a story in my mind as I went along. And the work got easier because the details that I was putting in were relevant to the story I was telling myself, even though nobody else has ever heard the story uh, because it's crass and personal. No, um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it was a story that was interesting to me and I uh -huh. can't imagine it would be interesting to anybody else. I have attempted, I think, to tell a story to a family member who glazed over or you know, left the room or something. Anyway, but the story that was in my mind got me through the construction of the piece. And if I would deviate from the story, then I would notice that the quality of my work would start to go down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I had the same idea reiterated to me when I went to try and get a job at a local bakery. They'd advertise for somebody that was a little bit more artistic, less, you know, they wanted somebody with some sculpting ability. So I sent them, you know, some photos and and went over there and they said, now we liked your work, but most of our customers come in and look at this idea book and they'll pick something from the book. Mm -hmm. So we'd like you to reproduce a few of these simpler cakes from the book. And so I tried to reproduce these things and it was very simple figures and I realized that there was no story there. It was a monkey and a lion and a tiger on a two-tiered cake that was green <laughs> and I could not do it. I could not get a mane to stay on the, the lion. My monkey really did have serious developmental problems. Uh, it, I could not, you know, no matter what I did, it looked like it was a cross between a koala and that gunk that collects in the bottom of your oil pan of your car. That is so hard to, to take because of the fact that, uh, you know, look at how amazing these are to, to think that you couldn't just take something and replicate it, you know, well, just and because. It was, it was a monkey with a ball head and a ball nose, and I'm trying uh -huh. to reproduce it. And they're looking at me, and I know they're thinking, he stole those photographs. It was not his work. <laughs> And uh, you know, and they were they were a little less nice to me. And I'm thinking, that, you know, I, how do I convince these people? And a part of me said, just do something really cool, really fast. <laughs> but I had the same problem. There was no plot line. I was just trying to impress people, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it. And I looked and felt very stupid. Um, and I'm like, this is it. This is my kryptonite. Unless I've got a story. I can't do it, and I can't just, you know, take an image, say, oh, well, that looks cool, and I'll just recreate it. Um, and I'm sure that there are other people that also think that I lie about my work, because they've seen me in action, and they go, that doesn't look anything like the pictures you showed us, you liar. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't get that job, and uh, I'm afraid to go back. Um, I, I do want to go back and go, look, see what I can do, but they won't believe me because I couldn't make the circle head monkey. Let's uh, move <laughs> on to the next slide. Oh, dear. Um, someone asked about this picture also. Um, how large is this figure? This figure is about 15 inches tall um, from uh, the surface of the, the platform to the top of the hat. Okay. Um, actually, she met with a disaster once, so she's been redone, reworked a little bit. This okay. is actually the piece that uh, that that woman was actually the piece that that put me on the Facebook map because oh, really? uh, Becky Rink took a photo of it at a cake show and uh, tagged me, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of people that had never heard of me before and that I had never heard of suddenly were visiting my Facebook page. Well, I can see why. It's it's very impressive. Well, thank you. It's kind of you to say so. <laughs> um, now, this is actually, this is the photograph that I sent to the bakery, one of the ones, and uh, that made them think that I was a liar. Uh, and I choose this because this was... Uh, and I should have known when I walked in there I was screwed because I'd already figured out that I had to come up with a story and it really needed to be a little bit more personal. I wanted to compete in this division with, you know, the theme was uh, nursery rhymes. I'm like, okay, nursery rhymes, there's sort of a story there too, but 
and I struggled, I struggled, I struggled with the design until I started coming up with these things. Now, my father is the youngest of, of his siblings, so a lot of the books that were in my parents' house growing up were hand-me-downs. All of my cousins had gone through these things. Their uh, parents, my aunts and uncles, had tried to get, you know, declutter their house, and so a lot of books that came to my house that had been read and beat up, and several of which were a couple of different copies of Mother Goose Rhymes. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, I'll go back and I'll do the, the beat up used uh, taped binding book mm -hmm. you know, with, the, with the gold, uh, uh, whatever, I can't remember the word now, the gilding on the, the edges of the pages and the, the gold print on the cover. Uh, coming off. So the book was really beat up and once I got there I'm thinking okay and it should be sitting on a desk like the desks I had in school uh, with that really nice believable wood veneer. Mm -hmm. Some of you might. Anyway and of course I always had little scratch stuff scratched into it you know so and so is a jerk or whatever. <laughs> so I had stuff like Peter is a pumpkin eater or your mother lives in a shoe scratched into the surface <laughs> of the desk which was the cake board and then I was moving and I'm like okay now Jack jumps over the candlestick and I immediately went to jump and Jack flash it's a gas 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 so I said alright he's got to look like Mick Jagger and he's not going to have cleared the candle so he will be sitting on it he will be on fire so we're going to need some water maybe a fire extinguisher and the details just started coming in uh, and I had my piece and I had something to work with so that you know it looked better than circle headed monkeys <laughs> that's right um, and I think even because I had a storyline it helped me get a better Mick Jagger likeness we can probably move on to the next mm -hmm. slide um, because the likeness thing doesn't always work now this piece the significance is this is the first time somebody actually confirmed verbally that my theory was correct because I'd gone up to the Art of the Cake show in, uh, in Cleveland and the theme was from the garden. I'm like, going, I am so not the guy to do from the garden uh, because you know gardening is, is nice and involves fruits and vegetables and flowers and things that aren't really disturbing. And so I wasn't <laughs> trying to get a handle on that until, you know, I thought, you know, from the garden, it came from the garden. And then I had it. It was these vegetables that had come from, I don't know, some radioactive garden maybe. Anyway, they were coming out and they were going after the farmer and his wife. And I used as the farmer and his wife the couple from the Grant Wood painting, American yes. Gothic. Yes. Even though the couple in that painting, I believe, are actually brother and sister. So this cake is even weirder than a lot of people realize, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, so the couple on top is based on a brother and sister, but they are not in my version in any way uh, blood-related until they marry. But So I had these goofy vegetables uh, attacking the cake, and when the judging was announced, it was announced that I had just barely edged out somebody else, I think by a fraction of a point, um, which I thought was weird because I didn't realize they were giving fractions of a point until I was let in on the fact that one of the judges had said, I am going to throw in 0.5 points on this cake just to push it over because mm -hmm. I like it. It makes me laugh. I like the characters. And so that was my edge and I finally had confirmation I knew that the storytelling aspect was what was paying off and so hopefully what people are getting from this is that if you're trying to plan a cake and you want to do something you know with figures and things like that and it's not coming together get a story work out a story the story will kind of guide you through the details that you need I see, you know, people come up to me and they say, I'm really frustrated because I'm trying to do the kind of things that you're doing and yet mine's not working. But what they've got is a scene with stuff in it, like, you know, uh, 
I don't know, I'm trying to think mm-hmm. of just a generic example. Um, man in chair, because I've done a fair number of man in chair uh, cake toppers. Um, a man in a chair surrounded by even some of his, the things that, that he likes or the things that you see if you were to catch this guy in a chair. Um, and I say, well, you know, what's, what's the story? Why is this here? Well, it's one of the things that the guy has. Like, well, how does that affect the overall composition? Uh, it's, well, you know, it's, it's there because it's there when he sits in the chair. I'm like, okay, there's your problem. Is, you know, you need a reason for it to be there other than just that it's there. Is there a joke that you can tie into it? Is there... You know, can you change, if it's a magazine, can you change the title to be something that's relevant to his life in a funny way? Uh, and so when I see people that are doing that, when they've got little punchlines all over, I'm like, that's one that's going to do better than uh, Girl and Dog. Um, mm-hmm. Because there's a little bit more, there's those Easter eggs for the judges to look at and get kind of caught up in, and, and you reward them for spending that extra time with your piece. Because if you just throw in a lot of details that they then feel obligated to look at, but it doesn't, there's no reward for them, then, you know, they spend a lot of time on your piece, but, or maybe they don't. They just look at it and think they've seen it all because, yes, that's a magazine, or yes, that's a can of beer, or yes, that's, uh, but that's all it is. Um, but if you can change that brand of beer to something relevant to the guy or make it funny, you've put a story in there, and there's a payoff. I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, either that or I've just talked myself into a corner, which is <laughs> bound to happen sooner or later. Okay. Um, sometimes the story fails. Uh, I rushed this piece through production because... I was trying to impress somebody I knew would be at a particular show. Um, And I had some stuff. I knew I wanted to try and recreate Paul McCartney's uh, Hofner violin bass, at least part of it. Um, And I spent way too much time trying to figure out how to do that, working on the likeness. I think I got a decent likeness of Paul McCartney and George Harrison. Or I didn't, if everybody's still looking at this image going, who are those people? Um, Ringo Starr, not so good. John Lennon looks like my brother-in-law Charles. Does not look <laughs> like John Lennon. Uh, and I probably should have saved that had given it to Charles and said, "Look, I did you in food." Didn't think of that till later. But I originally intended to have Yoko Ono sitting as a little shoulder devil on John's shoulder, and I had I was going to put an octopus crawling around on Ringo because it's long octopus's garden. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to do something more with George Harrison. I got the Apple in there for Apple Records, but that was a quick fix thing because his hand was already in that position. I had to put something in it or people would just wonder what it was doing there. And so because I strayed from my story, my things that were going to be cool, uh, and maybe not everybody thinks that it's funny to have Yoko Ono as a devil on John Lennon's shoulder, but I do blame her for the breakup, so that's the way it is. It works for me. But I strayed from all of that, and it weakened the piece. And it didn't just weaken the piece, but it affected my ability to recreate a likeness of the face, which was very disturbing to me at that moment. I'm like, it's not just circle head monkeys. It, you know, it goes deeper. Um, and so I was very disappointed to find that, that my kryptonite was more more powerful than I had realized that it was, excuse me, that it was. But I, I departed from my storyline out of uh, necessity of time, and it, uh, it got me. And I think we can move on to the next slide. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is another example of when, uh, when you don't stick to your storyline. Um, Went out to Denver. That was a lot of fun. I um, have to imagine me and a couple other people close to my age driving across country in a van at very high speeds, listening to the music of ABBA um, very loudly. Um, 
It just doesn't seem like quite the road trip I envisioned when I was younger. thought the van would have flowers on it, be a VW van, and we'd be playing Hendrix or something. Um, but we got out there, and I had this story. I was in my episode was uh, the Extreme Alien mm -hmm. Challenge. And so I came up with this storyline that would drive my piece because I knew I was dependent on storylines. Plus, in Challenge, they generally like that kind of thing. So my story was a dream date with Miss Galaxy. I knew I couldn't use a dream date with Miss Universe, which really would have been better. But since Miss Universe is owned by Donald Trump, I wasn't going to mess with that. And plus, the challenge, they couldn't have used it anyway because he does have rights to that name. And they couldn't have used it. But Dream Date with Miss Galaxy. So this guy wins a Dream Date with Miss, Miss Galaxy, who he just imagines is a really hot babe. But she really is the hottest babe in the galaxy. She just doesn't happen to be from Earth. And mm -hmm. so when he finally, you know, gets beamed up to the ship where he's going to meet this gal, and she beams up, she's a really hot babe, just from an entirely different species. And he freaks out and screams. And now she is, she's trying to work with it. She's put on the lipstick and sort of dolled herself up to be as, as humanly attractive as she can. He, on the other hand, is a complete loser and just, you know, doesn't even give her a chance. He just screams. And so the final piece was the punchline of that story, that the guy freaks out. His toupee spins around because it turns out he's really not anywhere near as hot as she is uh, by Earth standards. You know, she's very hot by her own planet standards where he's pretty mm -hmm. much a loser. Um, you can't really see him too well because uh, he's behind me in this photo. But then I decided to show off. I strayed from my story because I wanted to do something a little bit cooler, so I had the cake up on three legs, and I started working stuff in that was just purely show-off stuff. Mm -hmm. And after building this thing three times, my center support was a little bit weak, and it snapped at just that great moment allowing my uh, my Miss Galaxy to splatter across the judging table because I didn't listen to my story. I was trying to show off. I see. And uh, still had a lot of fun. But uh, And the thing was is that then the judges, Keegan saying, look, you brought us the most developed story of anybody that we've had in here today, and yet the punchline that we're waiting for all day you didn't deliver. It didn't so, happen. you know, even though technically you're disqualified because you can't meet the height requirement, even if you'd gotten that thing back up, you know, the fact that we knew it was going to look lousy after having her splatter across the table, he goes, you know, you were going to get marked down. You can't promise a good story and then not deliver. Mm -hmm. So just remember that. Don't promise a good story if you really can't, can't make it. Let's move on to the next slide. How are we doing for time? Okay. We're doing, wrap up we're doing all maybe. right. Yeah, we'll have to. Um, but now some people are probably saying, you know, I, I don't really care about competing. I don't compete in cake shows. That's not my primary interest. Um, I was going to say something about this, but we may. I don't know if we need to skip past this or not. Um, I love these how much are the, more time do we want? Well, uh, we have about 15 minutes. Okay. So. Um, we can skip past this because this is just okay. sort of reiterating it's what I just picture. said. Only different example. But the idea is, without a good story, um, I, I can't do what I do. Um, mm -hmm. So let's keep moving. Let's move past this. This was part B of the one we just saw. Um, the same thing works out for me and my clients. Okay, I have tried to get by. You don't know the person that this piece is, is modeled after. But I, I nailed this dude. And I nailed the bride, <laughs> but not as attractively. Though, uh, on the times that I've seen her since, uh, I go, man, I really did get her, just not attractively. <laughs> okay, and so it was a great likeness, and people were very complimentary about the likeness, but otherwise, it was kind of a lackluster response to this cake, because I didn't have a great story. It was kind of mm -hmm. easy there, offering up a, a flower, kind of the Romeo, Juliet sort of thing. And it just didn't work, because the story wasn't there. Let's move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I love this one. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if people have seen the film uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but there's a scene where the cartoon rabbit handcuffs himself to a live actor. And then only to find out that there are no keys for the cuff. So, of course, hilarity ensues until they can get some to some point where they can cut the cuffs off with a hacksaw. Mm -hmm. And so they finally get to that point, and the guy's trying to saw it off his arm, but it's on there. he's resting his arm on a wobbly crate. And so the cartoon rabbit steadies the crate, but in doing so takes his hand out of his end of the handcuff. When the guy realizes that he's just taking his hand out, he looks at him and says, you mean you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? The rabbit responds, no, not at any time, only when it was funny. And that's kind of the way I feel. <laughs> only when I've got a good story, and preferably one that is funny to somebody, do I actually have any power. The rest of the time, I can't even do circle head monkeys. Now, this cake was for a guy, 75th birthday, spent a lot of his younger years working on old Volkswagens. And so here he is buried way too deep. You can't really get that deep into a Volkswagen's engine compartment. Mm -hmm. But the family thought it was hilarious because that's how they remembered him. It's like, what does dad look like? Well, he's got a blue face with a little Levi tag. <laughs> Levi tag there, and then, you know, some tread somewhere. Um, and so, you know, I knew I'd, I'd succeeded when, uh, when his son said, the only thing this is missing is the little kid standing there sweating, waiting for instructions like which tool to, to hand over. Because if your father's anyone anywhere like this guy, works on a lot of cars, as a little kid you spend a lot of time standing, waiting for orders to deliver a tool. Let's move on to the next slide. So by telling, it wasn't my story, it was somebody else's story, but it still worked. And now, mm -hmm. you know, somebody may be saying, well, that's great if you've got really good sculpting skills, but, you know, what if you don't have the great sculpting skills? Um, people love to see their own story. And so if you're sitting down with somebody, rather than saying, what are some of the things you like, and we'll just tie it together in a cake, get them to tell you a story. Because when they see it, one of the experiences that brought this home to me was this situation where I was not really pleased with the imagery that I created for an individual, but it told the story he wanted to tell, and it told it in a way that made him so comfortable that he could, you know, go look at this and tell the story, and his telling made it good. Mm -hmm. And because I had listened to what he said and recreated it, poorly in this case, he loved it. Um, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, please don't tell anybody I did this. <laughs> it's great. But, of course, <laughs> but he's in love with it because uh -huh. it tells his story the way he wants it told. So, of course, everybody knew images of this thing lasted for years. Follow me around to this day, and I can't escape it. Um, <laughs> but so you don't have to be the best artist, but you do have to listen to people and understand the story and the plot line. And it will, it will improve your work. If you've got a human figure or an animal figure, something that is part of this story, the pose, the position, positioning will, you know, if you get it right, you're telling the story right. And if you don't get it right, you're not telling the story right. So you keep working to get that right pose and you won't settle for, well, he's on the cake. So that's good. Mm -hmm. you, you keep pushing yourself. Because the story is the objective, not just getting the elements of the story onto a 12-inch round or whatever it is you're trying to do. Let's move on to the next slide. I... Okay. Um, this is reiterating some of the same things I've already said. Let's move on. Okay. So I did have a lot of fun working with that client. <laughs> and, uh, now, to wrap up, this was one where... I know a lot of people, have, you, you go to a cake show and somebody walks up to a gorgeous cake and they go, wow, that's a gorgeous cake, and they take photos of it. And if you are the person who created it, you're beaming because they are looking at your gorgeous work saying how gorgeous it is. Mm -hmm. And just as you're about to bask in a little bit more glory, they go, oh, look, SpongeBob. And they run off to look at the SpongeBob <laughs> cake and they take like, you know, 18 photos of the SpongeBob cake. 
And you're going, crap. Um, but then some people, what some people take from that is, okay, I'll do things that people are familiar with. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's great if, you know, if you can do things that people are familiar with enough that people love it. The problem is that uh, basically what you're, if that's the way you operate all the time, you're going to essentially be seen as a cover band. Now, I've seen mm -hmm. some really good Beatles cover bands, but if they ever try to do their own stuff, they're going to have to start from scratch because people know them as a Beatles cover band. And if you're just telling a common story that people recognize and you're telling it in a common way, then you may get, you know, people may, you know, cluster around your piece and take 18 photographs and then judges come by and look at it and they've seen it all before because how many cake shows have there been that have not had Spongebob or Dora or, you know, because these are very common themes and people love them, but they are kind of, it is kind of a cover band sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the same thing if you're trying to appeal to customers, you're always running the risk that they've seen somebody else do it better. And so if you're trying to impress them with, you know, your Raggedy Ann, well, that's a blast from the past. Does anybody still remember Raggedy Ann or did I just date myself? Oh, I, I totally do. Um, or Cat in the Hat, just to be funny. Um, you know, people have seen it before and they are going to compare you. So if you can stick to a story that is yours or belongs to that of, you know, your, your client that's very personal, you can cut down on some of that cover band feel. You're not being compared to other people quite as much. The point of this last image is I was trying to take a Renaissance Shakespeare idea and match it up with something I thought it was funny, Green Eggs and Hamlet. Just a play <laughs> of <great>. words. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't that original a phrase. People have done things with Green Eggs and Hamlet. But um, I was trying to blend these two. It turns out it was a real pain in the neck, and I was in way over my head. Every time I'd do something, I'd realize it was either too complex or I didn't you know, I was getting too far away from the Dr. Seuss imagery. But I put little signs around that, were half Hamlet, half Green Eggs and Ham. Like, you know, I will not eat them with a goat, and now Ophelia is in the moat, or now she's afloat, or something. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my ace in the hole, was people were chuckling because I managed to force these two together. And that was the <laughs> whole thing. And you know, I, the whole time I was afraid that I'd missed my, you know, my strength, my storytelling but managed to pull it off enough in the end to be different. Um, so, you know, the sermon today is try and be original if you can, but tell a story. If you're stuck, if you don't feel like, you know, what you're working on is going anywhere, build up the story, understand the backstory, incorporate it, take out stuff that isn't relevant. Um, and even if people don't know the story, if you tell it well enough, they can see that there's a story there and they will be drawn in. And they might even write their own story. Uh, I think somebody was probably writing their own story with the aging carrot jockey and the pear balancer. Um, mm -hmm. It was their story and they liked their story, so they stayed with it. But there was enough there to, to generate a story. And so that is my probably my best kept secret until I just revealed it now for why for any of my success in the cake world is that I manipulate the judges. Um, <laughs> in a good in way. ways that people <laughs> like to be manipulated. And now I will shut up for just a second. Oh, this, is, this is great information. Uh, you know, let's skip ahead to the question and answer portion right here. Um, we do have a few questions rolling in. Is that uh, the one about if a train leaves a station going 35 miles an hour? Because I don't know the answer to that. I think no, hopefully we, we won't stump you too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a, I think this is a really good one, and I think it has to do with your telling stories. Um, it's, it's uh, let's see, from Gonzuela asks, I'd like to know how Burton decides on which features to enlarge 
enlarge and accentuate on his sculpted caricatures. For example, when he sculpts people, he'll often make a feature really stand out, like the lips or a chin, etc. But it still looks like the person he's sculpting. I have seen him do this on his Barack Obama cake and others. Uh, where did he learn to do this and what tips can he offer to others who would like to try that technique? Also, I'd like to know how he got so devilishly handsome. <laughs> Good luck, Farnsworth. We're all rooting for you. <laughs> okay. Um, talk about a plant. Um, okay, the lips really are that big. You can deny it if you want, but they're that big. <laughs> <laughs> she um, now, um, with caricature, it's all trial and error, I think, for the most part. Um, and a lot of different characters have different approaches. Even with caricature, I find if I don't have a good story, and that was a point of that, the character that I had that we skipped past, was that I had had enough trauma associated with some of the people in that, uh, not the main character, just to keep myself out of trouble, but uh, the host and judges from Sugardom, uh, that it was enough to carry me through. But it's, uh, you're trying to create, you're trying to communicate an attitude and a feeling, that's why it's very easy to do somebody who's very famous, because you've seen them in a lot of things, and they probably have a public persona, and so particular facial expressions communicate you know, the emotions that fit that persona. Um, think of uh, JFK uh, looking, well, devilishly handsome, so his eyes are just a little bit closed all the time, kind of that, just to heighten that little twinkle. And um, Or you think of, I'm just throwing out initial people, LBJ, um, with his cigarette holder and his chin way up and I'm doing this intentionally because Gonzuela is Canadian so I'm you know just throwing out American presidents by their initials just to be rude um, <laughs> but there are certain things about people so you might enlarge somebody's chin Jay Leno he's got a big chin you make it bigger because it's something he has to deal with um, with some people though like they may have a big nose but it's really not their personality you might reduce it um, but Caricature is a whole class all by itself, so I'm not sure that there's enough time to really explain anything useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as far as being devilishly handsome, I use a stunt double who is actually handsome. No one has ever actually seen me. Okay, uh, you know, back to the whole caricature thing. Do you teach classes on actual caricature um, and and how to to do things like that? I have taught a few, generally as part of a uh, cartooning course. Uh, I think it would be fun, and I've talked to some people about uh, doing just a caricature class, because I think it would be fun, and it would be frustrating, but uh, because you know, rarely do you get a, a fabulous caricature the first time you know you sit down and it's always easy to do somebody easier to do somebody you know or somebody who's famous than somebody you've only seen in a photograph uh, but mm -hmm. you know there's so much philosophy behind it well I like to put philosophy in because then I can you know make the class longer and charge more wait I say that out loud <laughs> All right, so we have Stephanie Feltz is asking, uh, you know, same, same topic. Can you suggest any books, DVDs, you know, or anything like that that would be helpful for cartooning? When I write one, there will be a fabulous book or, or DVD, but All I haven't right. written one yet. Now, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, a good place to start is just any of the Betty Edwards books, uh, Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain. Uh, and she's got some others that are have similar names, uh, but some of that, if you're just trying to, you know, get from this is what a face looks like, and this is how I draw it, and even though it's not very good, to I can look at an individual face and replicate it. That's a great place to start. Um, as far as then developing a style, it's just finding people that whose style you like. Um, you can start with somebody like Al Hirschfeld, who does the line drawings that were so famous uh, on Broadway for many years. 
there's a guy, Sebastian Kruger, uh, who does some fabulous stuff. Anybody that's familiar with Mad Magazine probably can look at my style and go, wow, you read a lot of Mad Magazine as a kid, didn't you? Because <laughs> I was very influenced by a man named Mort Drucker. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if you can score a bunch of old Mad Magazines, I find just looking at what they do is almost as helpful as you know having somebody take you through a step-by-step -step saying, here's how you recreate my look. That's what works for me, but it doesn't work for everybody. Um, but uh, as far as books on caricature, there's only a few out there that I've seen, and that really kind of forces you into doing that person's style, and I prefer people develop their own style. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I'm developing more trucker style again, which is a bit of a problem. Good thing he's a lot older than me, and someday he'll be gone, and then I can just take over. <laughs> then it'll be your style. <laughs> I'll just change well, I my name. Take on more questions, um, we are pretty much out of time. I will ask this one last question because it leads into our next um, thing. Uh, we have. Let's see. It is Lori asks, do you find that you have more requests for classes than for cake orders? Um, I find that uh, that I'd rather have more requests for classes than cake orders. Um, uh, because a lot of times people, uh, I, t I tend to try and pursue certain kinds of clients these days. Um, because the people that say, I want this cake that's like this, and or if then somebody brings me an example and they want me to recreate it, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, uh-oh, circle head monkeys. <laughs> so, you know, I do, I do cater to kind of a niche crowd, um, and I, so I'm finding that I enjoy teaching people and helping them develop a style uh, probably more than I enjoy trying to replicate what somebody wants. So I admit that I have not been as diligent. Plus, I'm in an area where there's too many famous people around me that are that get most of the really fun jobs. And uh, so I'm you know, <laughs> disillusioned and bitter about Aww. cake. No, um, <laughs> so I probably actively pursue more classes uh, mm -hmm. than I pursue your, you know, your average cake order because you know, I'm pursuing my own bliss, uh, selfishly, I guess. <laughs> well, I understand that. I, I get to that, you know, to a point. You know, I, there was a point where I took any cake order I could get, and, and now it is more of a hobby thing for me instead of, you know, instead of taking any cake order I can get. So I like to well, do yeah, the, I, the fun ones. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to use you as an example of storytelling, and I forgot. I got so self-involved because I am very, you know, fascinated with me. But your <laughs> your love letters cake, which I've only gotten to see in photographs, unfortunately. Uh -huh. I saw the nautical themed cake in person up close. Oh, did um, you? My brother-in-law, who was in the navy, uh, oohed and awed over that too. By the way. <laughs> well, thank um, you. And didn't you do another one where you actually were painting words? in shapes on a cake? Yeah, well the, the nautical themed one was, it actually had um, a map on the bottom tier right. and, and so I had written, uh, hand painted all the, you know, all the names of the places. It was a map of Bermuda and that one actually did tell a story itself too. It, it was, my mom is from Bermuda and so it was a map of Bermuda and it was a, a tall sail ship that I replicated. It was called the Bermudiana or the Oh, spirit of Bermuda, and the flowers were native to Bermuda, and you know there was a, um, a, a thing on the top that was you know just a uh, what's it called? It, a round stone uh, gate type of thing, and it symbolized it, you know like eternity type of thing, and mm -hmm. and so you know it was it was kind of the story of the journey that uh, a couple will start out on, you know both starting a marriage and then, you know, moving on through their life through a, an actual physical journey. So it was it was kind of, that one That one was fun. But yeah, my love letters cake, I tried to tell a story with that one too. It was a story of my, my grandparents. Uh, they were 
uh, sweethearts and wrote to each other through the war. And so those uh, love letters were actual actual letters that they had written to each other. So I, I, you know, and and those cakes have both done really well, you know. So to add in my little two cents, I, yeah. I think that the storytelling does make a big difference. Well, and yeah, yeah, the one was very literal, the love letters, but the other one, like I said, I got to see that up close, and we spent a lot of time looking at that one. Of course, I didn't know any of the story you just told, uh -huh. but there was something there that kept pulling us back in. And probably some of those Easter eggs I was talking about, because we walked around that table, um, and you know, and I'm with my brother-in-law, who was in the Navy, he's now out of the Navy, but you know, was in for a while, and he really wanted to go look at trucks upstairs, <laughs> and yet he stayed down on the cake floor. So you know, obviously there was that connection. Well, good. <laughs> uh, so you know, again, it's not just me, people. I'm not. You know, yep. Well, you Amelia know, Amelia does it too. It's true, and and it that's I think honestly what has helped me be successful in my competitions that I've done. Uh, I think that you know there may have been other cakes there that were technically better than mine. I don't know. I I, no, I can't I mean, believe there it. are some amazing <laughs> cakes there. So I but but I think that you know and I think that uh, one one tip for everybody that's actually going to enter a competition and wants to tell a story. Make sure that you tell the good a story on paper, because you have an opportunity to explain your cake on paper. Make sure that you tell that good story through your paper, and it, you know, and and point out those, like you said, your little Easter eggs. Point out those little Easter eggs that, you know, that the judges, if they keep seeing those, that keeps them on your cake longer, makes that cake more memorable to them, and and that makes a lot of difference. You know, once they're emotionally invested in it, mm -hmm. uh, then that does a lot for your score. Yep. And I think that's why a lot of people are so uh, impressed with your work. And I think you hit exactly on what is your strong point, is your storytelling. So, yeah. All right, so for those of you that are interested, uh, Burton will be in... The Garden State Cake Show teaching teaching at the Garden State Cake Show on March 9th, uh, at the National Capital Area Cake Show also on April 6th, and the Central New York Show in October on October 5th. So these are all places where you will be teaching. Is that correct? Um, or I where certainly hope so. <laughs> uh, you have in the where, works. That's where anyway. I have classes, and then you know hopefully I will some of the things that I'm in talks about will. Will pan out, and of course, I will uh, just harangue about them on Facebook once anything else is finalized. So that yeah, so go follow Burton on Facebook. Uh, your website's cakefx.com, and make sure you guys uh, keep following him because, like Burton just said, there are some classes that he's in the works with, and we just couldn't put them up because they weren't finalized. So make sure you're watching out for him. He's he's very. Uh, skilled, very knowledgeable, and you know, I like your work. <laughs> I think it's great. Well, thank you, Amelia. You're very kind to say so. All right. Well, thank you so much for for joining us, Burton, and and thank you guys for listening in. And I hope you guys all have a great day. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Bye. Bye.